Welcome to Conversations on the Coast, the Bay Area's premier author interview program. Today we're going to talk about a book, the subtitle of which is most important. The title is The Essential Engineer, and the subtitle, Why Science Alone Will Not Solve Our Global Problems. The author is Henry Petrosky, who's written something like 14 books. This one is published by Alfred A. Knopf, and I really appreciate you coming by. Well, thank you for inviting me. The uh, wonderful thing about this book for someone like myself, who knows nothing about engineering, except when I went to graduate school, the engineering school was known for its wonderful kegger parties <laughs> that you know were really good and went on and produced a lot of women. So uh, that much I know about engineering. Beyond that... It's all a little vague. The book itself, though, is written very clearly and in accessible language. And you don't fool around. Right in the preface of the book, you let us know what the book's going to try to do. The book seeks to illuminate the differences between science and engineering and thereby clarify their respective roles in the worlds of thought and action, of knowing and doing. In particular, it focuses on how they can interact to define and solve some of the most interesting and pressing problems of our time, how to address climate change, clean and renewable energy, and other global threats and challenges. And that's the whole you know, point counterpoint to the book. On the one hand, you're at pains to show the distinction between scientists and engineer, and then you turn right around and say, they got to work together. Well, that's right. I, they, they, they have different roles, but uh, problems that uh, we expect to be solved uh, these days uh, require more than just a one-dimensional type person. It requires uh, yeah. real cooperation. Yeah, that's, that's why there are, there are two kinds of interaction. Uh, they, they could be working on a project, trying to solve a problem together. And then the, the other part where there's interaction, which is fascinating to me, is that within a career, Someone might go from scientist to engineer or engineer to scientist? That's right, yes. Yes, there have been many examples of that. Uh, engineers uh, differ from scientists simply uh, in, in this way. Uh, scientists, their, their main objective is to understand, is to understand the, the universe and uh, the things that are uh, in it. Uh, the engineer, on the other hand, and this is, of course, overly simplified, but there's uh, the element of truth to it, the engineer wants to create new things, wants to develop new devices, uh, new systems, new ways of, of doing things. Okay. And the other thing that you say is that science is about knowing, engineering is about doing, or as I once heard in a lecture on climate change, science is worn, engineers fix. Yes, I, that, that caught my ear because <laughs> I think it's a very pithy way of say, saying it. Yeah. I, I I had a next door neighbor when I moved when I lived back on the East Coast on Freeport, Long Island, and uh, he was an he was an engineer and a very bright fellow, and uh, uh, there wasn't anything that he wouldn't attempt. He loved challenge and he loved you know oh that's stuck let me get at that you know and all that kind of thing, and when he got uh, you know fired or released from his last place of work, he went into business for himself. Mm -hmm. And he dealt directly with the government, making a better this or a better that. And I went to his shop once, and it was incredible, all these hunks of things <laughs> laying around. Uh -huh. <laughs> and buddies there putting them all back together. Well, what you described evokes to me uh, Thomas Edison's invention factory. That's what, what Edison was, was basically trying to do. Uh, he had people helping him, but he also needed this wonderful stockpile of different materials because he never knew when he might want this or want that. Yeah, yeah, they had to be there. They had to yeah, be there, they right? they had to be there. So the, the thinking of, of scientists is what, what I think you call observational and predictive, while the thinking of engineers is conceptual and constructive. By constructive, you mean that he's going to Making build, things, gonna, gonna building make, things, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, 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 the Conceptual part of engineering is very important, uh, and, and not it's not fully appreciated always, in in my opinion. What engineers want to do is by making new things, uh, they want to take advantage of whatever is out there, of course, to build upon, uh, whether they be theories of science or whether they be materials that are available in 
you know, this storehouse. But uh, uh, effectively, uh, the engineer can't get anywhere unless he or she first conceives of something, what, what it is that is to be done. This, this creativity is really a big part of it. Many uh, professional definitions of engineering incorporate both the word science and the term art. That sci- engineering is the art of applying science to achieve certain objectives. Mm-hmm. You're very clear, though, that, uh, I mean, you give some real-life examples mm-hmm. about what uh, an engineer or engineering can achieve. You write, among the key decisions in the Apollo program was exactly what sequence of spacecraft maneuvers would take place between Earth and Moon. There are n- There was no single right answer. Mm-hmm. And that's where the engineer really gets going. No- well, that's right. That's one of the things that also characterizes engineering is that there is no single right answer. Uh-huh. There can be many right answers, and they're right for different reasons, and they're also can, they also can be wrong for different reasons. Uh-huh. The big challenge to uh, engineering is to is select the right uh, answer for the right reason. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no single right answer, as there may be, uh, to a uh, mathematics or physics problem. Again, that's getting into the distinctions, the various options uh, would have their pluses and minuses. And the trick to engineering, as you said, is to play one off against another to achieve the desired and within a reasonable budget of time, cost, and risk. Mm -hmm. And that's the other part. The engineer always has to be in that practical realm of time, cost, and risk. That's right. And it has to trade off uh, among them. And recognize that if you uh, give up in one category, you probably uh, accumulate more risk or expense or whatever it would be in the other categories. In addition to exhibiting great precision and clarity, the essential engineer displays a fighting spirit. Are you kidding me, you say? (laughs) Uh, Stay tuned. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster COC. Or send an email to jimfostercoc at gmail.com. Why Science Alone Will Not Solve Our Global Problems. That's the subtitle. The title of the book is The Essential Engineer. The author is with us is Henry Petrosky. Publishers Weekly had some very interesting things to say about this book. He, they say you're the foremost American civil engineer explaining to lay audiences the nature of engineering and its crucial role in improving the world. Petrosky has long been, are you ready for this word? <laughs> outraged. I like that. I like that. Long been outraged by the persistent elevation of scientists over engineers in terms of intelligence and creativity. Yet none of Petrosky's 14 books on technology has argued so aggressively. Well, oh, I've got a tiger in here, I tell you. That. <laughs> as I can so aggressively as his newest, that engineers do not merely apply the scientists' discovery, what scientists discover instead. Engineers seek the most appropriate solution out of several to any engineering problem, not the supposedly single solution requiring diligence rather than depth. Finally, far from being hostile toward science, nice guy, He's, you know, angry, but nice, outraged, (laughs) but cool. Far from being hostile towards science, Petrosky pleads for continued cooperation between science and engineering. And you do. You do do all those things. And I think that the book does, uh, the review from Publishers Weekly does characterize the spirit of the book. And that's why I spent so much time. Well, I, I think it's it's fair on on that level that it that it reviews the book. It's a limited uh, length number of words that the reviewer had at his or her disposal and yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, used them rather rather uh, concisely and telegraphically. <laughs> well, and also the purpose of a positive review in in Publishers Weekly is to get booksellers hot for the book. And I, and I think it does a good job of that. Yes, I, I would say. Yeah. I want to go back to the question I, I promised I would ask you when we were off mic before we started. And uh, it, it's very clear that you do a beautiful job of making the distinction between a scientist, science and engineering, and what a scientist does and what an engineer does. 
it's very clear that it matters very, very much to you. And I'm, I'm just wondering, why should it? Why should we care? Well, you know, there are a lot of uh, debates going on in, in Washington today and uh, uh, generally uh, throughout the government and through uh, in, in, in policy-making discussions uh, about what we should do about the climate, what we should do about global global issues. And every now and then we hear from uh, Washington that uh, we should support science, and science is important because it's science that will bring innovation in dealing with these these problems. Right. Well, uh, there is something left out of out of that uh, statement, and that is that science doesn't innovate other than within science. Science is there to understand things, not to change things. Strictly speaking, uh, it's engineering that takes and acknowledges what science is saying and says. We do want to uh, change the situation. We do want to alleviate some of these, these problems. We do want to protect the environment and so forth. How are we going to do that? Well, it's, it's engineering that's going to do that, not, not science. So I think it's important for people to understand that there are distinctions between science and engineering and that they, they have a profound impact on public policy and on legislation uh, being written correctly. And I would say, uh, reading your book, that early on in your career, when you were a student, uh, you you grasped what I would call, and you don't call it this, but I would call the power of being an engineer, the power of engineering. And uh, it, it says, as, as engineers, we students, we're going to be in a position to change the world, not just study it. That's exactly right. And, that, and engineers have have long thought this way, and uh, many very very consciously and uh, you know, recognized what it was that they were uh, they were doing, and a, a capable of doing, uh, given the support and the not always the support of science. Not that scientists didn't want to support engineers or engineering, mm -hmm. but very often the science isn't simply there to make advances. Uh, mentioned the moon landing before, and there was a difficult uh, decision to make about exactly how to get there. But there was also a very important decision about how to get back. And <laughs> oh, <why>, yeah. <laughs> why is it that we went to the moon? One of the reasons we went to the moon was in support of science, that uh, the scientists wanted to know what what is really the moon made of. It's not green cheese, we suspect, but what is it? So one of the big objectives of the, of the mission was to bring back moon rocks, to bring back samples of the moon so that geologists here on Earth Scientists could study them and understand further about the moon. But look at what the engineers were challenged with. They were challenged with going and landing a device on the moon and blasting off from it with a load of rocks that they didn't know <laughs> the nature of. That's right. And, that's right. Yeah. That's the kind of thing that, that engineers are constantly challenged to, to do. And it certainly is not hard to recognize the import of that. But look what else engineers have, have done for us. I mean, the Industrial Revolution, one of the big uh, things that the Industrial Revolution depended upon was the steam engine. That really changed. It enabled us to locate plants not near a source of water power, but anywhere where we could that's right. the steam that's engine. Right. You get the steam engine in there and you get the power. That's right. And going across the ocean by sailing ship in the early 19th century was an ordeal that was unpredictable because it depended on the weather, on the winds. If the winds were with you, you might make it from England to, to America to New York, say, in two weeks. If the wind was against you, it might take you two it's months. Two months, yeah. What this meant, of course, that there could be no scheduled shipping. The scientists of the time, some scientists, I should say, uh, said that it was impossible to build a steamship that would cross the ocean in a predictable manner because, because the steamship would not be able to carry enough coal to accomplish that. But engineers uh, believed that they, they could because they understood that the larger you make the ship, the less resistance there is to it moving. The Essential Engineer. It's a book that not only gives you new information, it also reveals things about the familiar you never heard of before, like Albert Einstein's refrigerator. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster COC or send an email to Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. Henry Petrosky is here. He has written a great book, uh, one that I really enjoyed and didn't think I would, I guess. 
The essential engineer, it's called. Why science alone will not solve our global problems. Library Journal wrote about it. Engineering is one of the least understood professions. Uh, You've been trying, but, you know, it still (laughs) is. Most people envision engineers as math-loving geeks with an affinity for pocket protectors. But what do they do? What is their role in society? Petrosky specifically compares scientists and engineers, drawing clear examples from both current and historical projects. He notes that while both groups often work together, their outlooks are fundamentally different, entertaining and informative. The review concludes. Now, one of the things that I I think people don't think much about when they think of engineers is that they are frequently and necessarily engaged in what I think you call a creative process. The design of engineering structures is a creative process, you write, in the same way that paintings and novels are the products of creative minds. That's a mouthful. That's a mouthful. Well, it's the pretty much the way it way it is. The engineer is presented with a, a problem or a challenge to uh, put a bridge across the Golden Gate, for example. Okay. And uh, what what kind of bridge do you put across there? It's uh, a longer distance than had been spanned anywhere in the world at the time in uh, a single leap. And uh, it's not at all obvious. You can't just copy another bridge and scale it up. You you have to give quite a bit of thought, and you have to have an inspiration. You literally have to have that spark go off that says, this will work. And the, the, the true engineer will, will know viscerally that, yes, this will work, uh, and then goes on the process of, of proving that this, this will work. And then when people are convinced, including those that are expected to pay for it. Uh, it's Especially gets built. them. It, you know, <laughs> they, they have a lot to say. <clears throat> they sure do. They sure do. There's a, 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 a wonderful chapter title here called, Which Came First? And uh, one of the stories you tell in there is about the Wright brothers, mm-hmm. the Wright brothers who were uh, great in uh, bicycle work in Akron, Ohio, if I remember correctly. And uh, they, then they started thinking about flight, and uh, then they're then they're flying long before anyone had figured out what a wing does in terms of flying. That's right. The Wright brothers sought out all the science they could find to help them design an airplane that would uh, be be powered by a by an engine. Uh, but they found that the there just wasn't enough science. You just couldn't take the science that was known and, and extrapolate from mm, it. Mm. Uh, so they basically uh, did whatever science they felt was necessary to help them with that wing problem. And it was not just the wing, but it was like a propeller that they saw as sort of a rotating uh, wing. And it was that kind of insight. It was that kind of uh, leap of the imagination that, that, was, uh, able, that, that enabled them to accomplish what they, what they did. So sometimes engineers actually have to do science. Sometimes scientists have to do have to engineering, do engineering yeah. or invention. Again, you know, further, further reason that they've got to work together. Exactly. Got to learn how to do it. Oh, gosh, we got to get to uh, Albert's refrigerator. How, I mean, come on, it's MC squared. No, nothing about refrigerators in there. Well, Albert Einstein uh, was uh, fascinated by things. He grew up in a, with a family business that made electrical devices and, uh, he went to went to school to study physics. Uh, he wasn't that great a student uh, by his own admission. He had a hard time getting a job, so he finally worked for the patent office because uh, that was the only job he could get, <laughs> to be quite frank about it. And uh, he had a lot of time uh, studying patents, of course, but he, had a, it, he claimed later in his life that it gave him a lot of time to think about physics. And uh, he was fascinated by the inventive mind because he believed that fundamentally inventing something like a refrigerator, a better refrigerator, was not fundamentally different than uh, coming up with a new theory of the universe, literally. And uh, the, the kind of refrigerator he came up with was, was uh, the problem was driven by uh, difficulties in the refrigerants that were used early on. They were poisonous. And he yeah, wanted no. to eliminate the fat possibility of that leaking, to make a long story short. Good man. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that you spend a lot of time on in terms of uh, current and future problems is alternative energies. And, and the one that really stopped me was that uh, you, you seem to have 
a lot of good thoughts to, uh, about something called tidal power as a source of energy. Why is that? Well, the tidal power was actually used a lot in previous centuries. Uh, there, there, there were things called tide mills, uh, and, and when the tide comes in, it's high, of course. Well, if you capture that high tide by moving a gate to trap it in a cove or something, then when the tide goes out, you can lower that gate or raise it and let this water that you've captured come out, and it drives your mill. So it, you really just take what naturally happens twice a day and turn it into energy. This has been explored uh, and used in many, many situations. It's been proven to, to work, and uh, it is something that isn't as exploited as much today as I think uh, it really should be. Should be, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you, you also talk about powers from under the sea. Or under the water. Well, there, there's we we know we have wind turbines that capture the energy in the in the air. Well, you can also put a turbine under uh, the water to catch the currents uh, in a river, a tidal river, or uh, just some natural currents like the Gulf Stream, uh, for example. And uh, these will basically generate power by uh, turning like propellers. We're in the uh, we're in the home city almost. Palo Alto, to be precise, of Tesla. Hmm. And what do you think of their chances? Who's, whose chances? Tesla, the automobile maker? The automobile, yeah. yeah. Well, I think they, like all electrical uh, electric automobile companies, have to solve the battery problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe they themselves don't have to solve it, but they have to rely on somebody providing a battery uh, pack that is going to be a little less expensive than they are now. Because and a it, little less cumbersome. And li if, if possible. Yeah, I mean the, the the Tesla cars that have been developed have they're successful, but they're very expensive. We've Absolutely. just gone through some of the things you can find out if you're smart enough to go out and get your copy of the Essential Engineer: Why Science Alone Will Not Solve Our Global Problems. The author is Henry Petrosky. He's been with us on Conversations on the Coast. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster C O C. Or send an email to jimfostercoc at gmail.com.